This week on Merchants of Change, we've got Donnell Boucher. Donnell played football at Worcester State and had an incredible coaching career, including a 14-year run as Director of Strength and Conditioning at the Citadel. Donnell is the Director of Business Development for the College and Pro Sports Division at Play. Here he is, Donnell Boucher. I'm J.R. Butler, co-founder of The Shift Group, and you're listening to Merchants of Change. This is a podcast about transferring the skills and behaviors we acquire as athletes into being a professional technology salesperson. Each week, we'll introduce you to a top performer who will help us understand how they became professional merchants of change. What's up, kid? How's it going, Donnell? It's going good, man. Happy to be here. I'm, I'm very happy to have you here. Uh, today on the show, we've got Donnell Boucher. Donnell, thanks for being on the show. Um, for context, you know this. I know you're a listener. Um, Merchants of Change is really a show for you know folks that are transitioning into sales, folks that are new to sales. Um, and our mission at Shift Group is simple. We want to help elite athletes and military veterans successfully transition into sales careers. Um, and all our podcasts are, are just like you. They're, they're former athletes or former veterans um, that have had success in sales. And, and your background is a bit different than uh, any guests we've had before. Um, we had a guy named Billy Lynch who coached college football um, at Rice. Um, but you're our first strength coach, which I'm fired up because anybody who knows college football loves, loves them some strength coaches. Um, so so we, like to, we, we, we like to start with the, the sports and coaching career. So this is a really broad question by design. Um, what are some of your favorite memories playing sports? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, if I, if I, the, f the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about just impactful memories that stayed with me to this day, um, happened in high school and I'm from Western Massachusetts. I grew up, I played, um, uh, I played high school football at Chicopee Comprehensive and by no means is Western Massachusetts a hotbed for high school football, right? So, uh, we did it, love it a game. We had great friends out there. Um, there was a culture of sports, but it wasn't anything like you think when you think even Eastern Mass or certainly not <laughs> Texas and, and the Southeast of the country. I mean, it's, it's kind of a small deal, small time deal out there, but you know, we, we got playing and we, in our city, Chicopee has this game called the sword game and it's Chicopee comp versus Chicopee high. And it's been played for decades. And, uh, we compete for the mayor's sword. Uh, he's got this, this civil war, uh, saber. And the winning team gets to have that sword on display at their high school for the remainder of the year. And when I was in high school, our school had lost that game, I want to say, 12 years in a row. And it was my junior year. Um, I had been starting since sophomore year. And we're, we're at the sword game. So big deal. The whole town is there. All the, the, the weekly, the pageantry leading up, it's, uh, it's about as big as a high school game could be in that, in that part of the state. And uh, we won, you know, long story short, we won for the first time in, in a long time. And that was my first exposure to, obviously, there's a lot of upside to sports. And, and you guys on this show have, have dealt with that. You've done deep dives into that. Um, but the, the reason that memory stands out is, first of all, we, we reversed the curse, so to speak. Um, people where I was from thought we were never going to beat uh, Chickabee High uh, because it had been so long. And when we won that game, I got a sense of, man, like there's, there's people in the community that are really, really bought in to what we're doing as athletes out here on the field. And I had never thought about that. I had never had that be something that was like in front of my face, uh, in my, in my athletics career leading up to that point. But when we won that game and just the celebration afterwards, uh, the weekend, uh, listening to my, my, my older brother's friends, my older sister's friends, who talked about, man, it's been over a decade since we've beaten them and, and how lifted up they were by, by the game and, and us players, uh, was really kind of a moment for me where I was like, man, this is, this is special. This goes beyond just suiting up, going out there, 
and competing against an opponent. There's actually a bigger thing going on here, and I better respect that. And, and I certainly appreciate it. I got moved by it when I was, you know, 17 uh, years old. And it was something that I was kind of stuck in the back of my mind. And I saw that concept uh, revisited at different times and it became more real. You know, that was high school in a, in a city rivalry game. Um, obviously the stakes changed when you, when you got to college and the game got a little more serious. And then as a coach, when you start realizing family, like the, the coaching staff's families and how they're invested and they're, they're a part of that coaching staff as much as you are. Um, you realize that you're playing for something bigger. And I think in sports, you learn that by feeling it and experiencing it more than somebody telling it to you. So that's like the first memory that, that sticks out from competing. Um, but, uh, do you want me to go on there or, or, or move on to you college? Got, or? Yeah. You got something from coaching that, that, that jumps out at you. Definitely. Like, like my mind was just going to, yeah, no, that was that. Now what, what about college and like my experience at the Citadel and being a coach yeah. on that side of it. And it's weird. Like I don't, I could definitely talk about, we were a part of, a, of, of some awesome wins back to back championships for the only time in the history of the school. Um, I saw our women's volleyball team win, win a championship, which was nuts considering a military college and, and a female sport. Um, uh, those memories were great, but again, like when I look back and think about, man, what really stands out to me that to this day I cherish and I, and I value the experience is the fact that I get invited to weddings, uh, from, from, from athletes that graduated 12 years ago from the Citadel and we still stay in touch. And I see these kids and their, and their family and their, and their wives, they have their children and their families start. And, you know, you, you, you go out and you see, um, some alumni from six, seven years ago and their families there and their, their, their father and mother come up and they shake your hand and thank you for the impact that, they, that you had on their, on their child when they were, when they were there playing under you. Um, those are the memories that, that stand out, the strong bonds that came out of, uh, that, that coaching role and being a part of the school that so tightened it with their alumni base and the tradition there. Um, it would be those, those memories for sure that, that stand out. I, I, it's hard to explain like the rewards of coaching if somebody's never done it before. So like, I, I totally agree with you and, and dude, you'd be surprised. Like, and I know you've heard it. Like we've had NFL, NHL guys on here. When we ask them their favorite memory, almost everybody goes back to high school. So like, I think that's a pretty, that's like a pretty normal feeling. I know I do for sure. Um, now I, I, I always think back to my playing and, and, times I've coached and there's, and there's certain characteristics of teammates of kids that I've, that I've worked with that jump out at me. Um, what is, what, like, what, when I ask you that question, like of, of former teammates or, or kids you've coached, is there any like, like, uh, parallel characteristics that you think of or, or people that are like, you know, it's, it's, it, they just jump out in your mind. Yeah. The, the, First group of people is, that, is when I arrived at Worcester State in in uh, in 2001, and you know up to that point, I, I was a I was a, a good player, but I was never a great player. I wasn't all state. I think I made all Western Mass. I was the team captain. I was a good player for where I was from. But going to college, you you you, you immediately get into that small fish in the big pond uh, environment again. And Worcester State at that time, 2001, it had this mix of seniors that were on that team that were, these guys were not straight arrows, man. They were, they, they went, you know, went to UMass, but didn't, they couldn't handle the structure. So they ended up coming back down to Division Three, <laughs> then next to where they grew up in, in central Massachusetts, you know, try, tried out at Maine. It just didn't work out. Didn't want to be far away from home, came back to Massachusetts. So it was like this, this mix of talent that was able to play at division one, but didn't work out. So they ended up there at division three. I remember walking into the first team meeting, I'm looking around at our, at our seniors. And I was like, dude, I'm never going to play here. Like I was five, nine, 205, 210 pounds. The linebackers in front of me were six, two and six, four. And, and just everybody looked like, they, they were just bigger, faster, and better than I was ever going to be. And I, I like, I questioned whether or not I was even going to play there, which I thought like, Hey, division three, 
I'm going to go in here and I'm going to immediately have a role. So that casts a little bit of a doubt, but what, what, what impressed me beyond just the way that they looked at that initial meeting was because they had been at the bigger schools, they learned how to practice at, at the bigger schools. They learned how to study film at the bigger schools, which I, this is my first exposure to college football. And Division Three is not like Division One in terms of the preparation that goes in week. You just don't have the time. Uh, you've got more time allocated when you're at the Division One level than you do at the lower levels. And because these guys had experienced that, a good number of them, that's the way that we prepared. So I remember going into meetings and, and watching people take notes and the things that would be, the concepts that were being talked about in film study. And, uh, you know, you get to uh, the Sundays and Sundays there was conditioning and lifts before practice, which was new to me. And to watch these guys who, like I said, maybe they weren't the straightest of arrows, right? These guys were, they knew how to have their fun. They knew how to go out and compete on game day and practice hard, but they had lives uh, outside of football. But when it came time to practice or in the off season, 6 a.m. rolled around on a Wednesday when we didn't have any obligations. Um, one of the seniors would organize a conditioning session at 6 a.m. on Wednesday, no matter what you did Tuesday night before. Um, and they were there. And so being around them and watching that resiliency and resolve because they knew what the game took and no matter what they did on the weekends, it was never going to impede their commitment to what it took to have a chance at winning. Mm -hmm. um, so that group of guys really ingrained in me, no matter what you're going to do and what you're going to get into outside of sports, you, you got to make sure you're committed to waking up at 6 a.m. And, and, and sweating it out, sweating it off. And, yeah. um, and, and that was an awesome experience to, to, to walk right into as an 18 year old. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember you telling me, I, unfortunately, I've gotten to meet a lot of those guys and, and I can agree that they go hard, uh, for sure. <laughs> um, but like, you know, it was like walking, they were men, right? Like they were men and it was like, oh my God. Right. I can totally relate to that with my experience at Holy Cross hockey. Um, now I got a chance to come down to, to Charleston and visit you. Uh, I got to see the weight room, got to walk around campus with you and, and the Citadel is such a special place. Um, like, I, I can't emphasize that enough. We, we've been fortunate to have a couple alumni come through the program. But can you just, like, share a little bit about the experience at the Citadel and, like, what you did in your time there? Because you spent such, such a big chunk of, of your life so far down there uh, being a big contributor to the program. Sure. So for, for the people listening that are not familiar with the school, it is the Military College of South Carolina. Um, we have in this in the country, we have uh, federal service academies, which are your Army, West Point, your, your Naval Academy, Air Force Academy. And you've got your senior military institutes. Um, the Citadel is one of those. VMI would be another one. Um, so they're, they're at the service academies. Everyone that goes there is obligated to go and serve in the armed forces afterwards and in, in whatever branch that the academy they're at. Um, senior military institutes are not like that. You, you, you go for the military structure, the military lifestyle, the demanding academics, but you're not bound to serve afterwards. Um, they're public institutions and, and the Citadel is run by the state. Um, but it is every bit of the military experience. Um, all of the undergrads there, all of the athletes there are in a uniform. Uh, from, from the minute they get out of their room uh, to, the, to the moment they go back to their room, uh, that's, a, that's called a duty uniform. Um, they put that on. There's a certain way to wear it and, and the way that they make their bed, the way that they keep their room. All that stuff is inspectable at any time. So there's, there's, there's that side of it they have to experience. And, you know, you learn through that process it, just the most extreme like deep dive into time management that you could imagine uh, because there's, there's a, there's a training schedule for every single day and you got to be where you're supposed to be. And, and there's no, you know, like my college experience, I had a couple, like maybe a nap time in the middle of the day, I could go get an extra bite to eat if I wanted it uh, before practice. <laughs> and it was weird, like flexible. You, you make your own schedule to an extent, not like that at the Citadel, man, you, um, you know, every, everything is, is, is being scrutinized and your personal appearance to the way that you report to a meeting, 
Um, all that stuff is inspectable and you've got to pass inspection. Um, so there's what the, the takeaway that I have in, in my time there is these, these young men and women, they're, they're learning how to navigate cost benefit, um, in a way that I did not have to learn in college because if they are going to make a decision like, all right, I'm going to show up to class 10 minutes late for whatever reason. Um, you know, not only are you getting into hot water with that professor, but you're going to earn demerits and there's going to be a discipline consequence along with that, which may result in you having to work those off in, in tours. Uh, a tour is you, you stand in the barracks and you walk back and forth for an hour. Um, so the, the, the cost benefit experience that the, the cadets have when they leave that place, I think it develops their critical thinking skills. I think it develops a real sense of awareness into like, all right, how is this decision going to impact the next three and four moves of the day of the week? And um, yeah, I got to be a strength coach there. I started off as that was my title. Um, I, I, well, I went down there as a graduate assistant and within two weeks got hired as the top assistant. 10 months after that, I got hired as the head guy. So within a year's time of arriving on campus, I took over as the head strength coach. It was, it was a little bit of luck. But it was a lot of capitalize on, capitalizing on my prior experiences. I was a little bit older than the other graduate assistants that were there at the time. And um, I've always been a relationships guy. So from the moment I got on that campus, I tried to really connect with the, with the cadets. I tried to connect with my coworkers and the coaches that were there. And when the time came uh, a year later to apply for the head job, I had built up some equity with these people where they, you know, they, they, were, they were able to sign off on me taking over. So 25 years old. Not many people become a head strength coach at the division one level at that age, but that was me. And, um, I had, I've been promoted a couple of times since then. I, my title had changed ultimately at the end. I was an assistant athletic director and I also served on the, um, on the executive team. I was like a junior administrator at the school. And so my last five to six years, I was in administrative meetings a good bit of my time. And I was, I was in, I wasn't maybe a key player in the decision making process, but I was, close to it. And I was right there in the room and I got to witness and observe the way that the administrators, the vice presidents, the, even the academic folks on campus, the provost and her team would make decisions about um, the budget. And, and these are big ticket decisions, right? Stuff that strength coaches don't always get privy to. Um, so that's how the career kind of ended. And I think in a nutshell, it, ultimately, it's what kind of led me um, towards this direction, but really kind of unexpectedly. And I'm sure we'll get into that at some point here on the talk. Yeah, I, I, I vividly remember you uh, you studying for like all the strength, the strength and conditioning certifications, and and you know you were you've always been super passionate about like that space in general, um, like 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 really really passionate about it. So like, was that always the plan? Like, what made you want to become a strength yeah. coach? Yeah, man, that, that's a yeah, that's a great point. Um, so if I if I was to point my finger at what's the what was the, the first thing that I can again what stands out in my mind? I can remember being a freshman, and it was it was the first time I played football, and we're in our weight room at Chickabee Cop, and it is a closet. It's a closet <laughs> with a bench. There's some there's some medical tape on the bench. There's like there's like six broken dumbbells on the ground, one bar, and and just this hodgepodge of weights, and and I was in there. With a couple seniors, a couple juniors, and a couple sophomores, and maybe one or two other freshmen, and we're just messing around. And at some point, two hundred pounds gets on the bar, and and it was like there was like one senior, one junior, and nobody else could lift it. And uh, you know, the, the freshmen are like, "I'm not even going to try that." But me, at freshman year, I was I was I was 180. I was like 185 pounds as a freshman, and. Um, I'm like, all right, let me give it a shot. And, and I could do it, man. I got it up for one. And like thinking about it now, 200 pounds, it's like nothing. At, at, like to th but when you're, when you're 14, 15, yeah. and you're the, only, you're the only freshman that could do it, I, I, I remember seeing the expression on people's faces. And, and in my subconscious, I was like, man, like that, this could be my thing. Maybe I can be good at this. And it was the first time I felt like that. Like I never felt like that in math or, <laughs> or science or anything like that. I was like, man, maybe this could be something I could be good at. So that was like the first domino. And then I had uh, a couple mentors along the way that just 
right time, right place, said the right thing to me, took me under their wing, showed me one or two lifts. And just, I feel like honestly, dude, it was like, you know, Matt Damon and Goodwill Hunting. He's like, man, like, like when Beethoven sat down on the piano, he could just play. He's like, when I look at math, I can just play. When I, when I started learning about strength training and conditioning and how, how to write a workout up, how to sync, how to sync what's lifts, how to create a split, a training split, how to look at number of reps and sets and rest intervals and all that. I mean, it just made sense to me. Like, I, I, just, I just can't, I would read a chapter in one of the books you were referring to earlier. And it's like, I'm writing notes and I walk away and I got it. I, I go to the, I go to the weight room, I get on the whiteboard and I'm, and I'm programming of something I just read an hour ago. And so things had never stuck for me like that before. And this stuff was just sticking and it just, it just pulled me in and got me infatuated. And I'll tell you, man, Jeff, Jeff Oliver, Holy cross. Like he, he, to this day, he, he laughs it off, but he had a lot to do with it because at Worcester state, we didn't have a strength coach, so to speak. So some of those upper class, when I was talking about earlier, they were interning at Holy cross with, with Ollie and they would bring those programs back. And I'd look at those programs and I'd be so infatuated with them. And, and I'd, I'd try to go and create my own version of it on Excel. It's basically how I learned Microsoft Excel was sitting in the student section trying to copy all these programs from Holy Cross. <laughs> and so like, you know, one domino after another, man, I just, I got pulled into it because I was, I was kind of predisposed. I had an affinity for it. But then JR, what, what really flipped for me was around the time that I got to college and, and, and I met those older guys and I started having people around me that were more serious about training. I started noticing people started coming to me more. And in the off season, three and four guys would be out there. Then the next week we'd have seven and the next week we'd have 15 people. And I, I'm, I'm like writing the workouts. And so I realized at some point that the weight room could be a great educator. Like when you think about physical development, but there's also a psychological piece to it. There's certainly an emotional piece to it. And then there's something I think we all need, which is the social element. Um, as I started to mature, that got clearer to me. And I, and I really just bought in, uh, you know, all the way and just tried to become the best strength coach I could. And, and, and I did that all the way through. And it just led to a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a change in perspective. But the same principles and concepts and passions that were there are still applicable to what I'm doing now and what ultimately led me here. Um, so that, that would be the story in a nutshell of me being a strength coach and why I did it. I love it. I love it. And, and like, you know, I think there's a lot of listeners here that played at that D one level where you do have strength coaches. And I, 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 I can tell you, you mentioned coach Oliver, right? He's the reason I went to Holy Cross in the first place. Like, and he had such a huge impact on me. I've been fortunate. His son, Peter was a phenomenal player for Holy Cross this year. And I, and I oh. helped him with, some, with some career transition stuff. And it was like, awesome. I, I remember him being a baby doing pull-ups on, on all these freaking huge arm when he was little. So, um, yeah, dude, it's, it's such a great, it's such a great, uh, path to take and still and 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 have that impact on young people that you've had um is that what you, like what would you say you're most proud of of your time at citadel is that is that it the impact you've got to have on people oh oh for sure so like the, the like the, if the question that gets asked to me by my and, and i'm still in the industry so yep. even though i'm in sales now and in, in the business world the the customers that i'm going to visit with and the phone calls that I'm on and the conversations are all my peers from back when I was a strength coach. It's, it's strength coaches and administrators. And the first question everybody asks is, you know, do you miss it? You know, how, do, you, do you miss being on the floor and all that? And like the one thing that I think I, I, I miss now and I'll always miss though, and this is why I'm at peace with it, is the day-to-day -day interaction with the kids. Um, what, what, I, what I'm most proud about is the fact that like just yesterday I was at a meeting at a gym downtown that is owned by a Citadel alum, a Citadel baseball alum, who I coached for his last three years of school. He interned for me, and now he owns the, the, the biggest boutique gym on the peninsula of Charleston. It's, it's unreal. It's called Ethos Athletic Club. I was visiting with him, and in walks uh, a football alum that was like his classmate who has now moved back to Charleston, and he's in medical device sales now. And I hadn't seen him in a while. And, and, you know, we come over and it's like a, it's like a family reunion. So 
those the, the the positive relationships that have grown out of my career there, being at a place for so long, are absolutely um, what I'm most proud of. And um, do I miss them? Yeah, but those but those relationships they they didn't just disappear when I when nope. I transitioned, right? They they're nope. with me for life. Yeah. And so, sure, I'm I'm sure like the new crop of recruits. That would have been a new set of relationships, but you know what? I'm in a new company now. I got I got a new crop of recruits that I'm meeting, and I'm excited about the getting relationships with them. So I'm good. I'm in a good place. Um, but the, like the other things that, that I'm proud of being at that school was I never ran the same program twice. I was a constant like, how can we improve? Who can I learn from? And what can we add in to to because last year's program is not going to help this year's team. I never ran the same pl program twice. I'm proud of, um, and I think like you know we're we're in a in a business conversation here. Like, and this is just this is not about bragging, but I I I'm in the business world and sales, you guys have metrics. You have you have to talk about actual numbers. Like, I I received a raise for 14 years straight. Then it wasn't a huge raise, so don't let me get you too excited. Like it was it was I I received a raise for 14 years straight. Um, I had athletic directors that were willing to sit and listen to me. Um, if I had a if I had a job offer on a table, I could go to that table. Through that process, I learned how to negotiate and have a conversation with somebody wearing a suit. Um, I constantly, every two or three years, I I received new responsibilities, which I think speaks to the trust that the decision makers had in us and the and the program. Um, and and. And my staffing budget, like my, when I, when I got there, you know, I had me, which was a full-time salary and there was three graduate assistants, which are, they're not full-time salaries. They're, they're students who are basically getting a, a package deal, but going to school full-time in, in graduate school. And when I left there, we had increased the staffing budget over 200%, um, which when I think back to what the staff was when I got there to where it was when I left is amazing. And so as, as I, as I look back and think about how did I do it? I mean, it was, it was about having professional conversations, trying to learn the skills needed to, to sit down and talk with these people, understanding the expectations and pressures that they had on them and seeing things um, at, from the big picture standpoint uh, that, that ultimately allowed me to do those things. So those, those that, I'm proud of that stuff for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and like, you know, we've, we've been fortunate to help a lot of coaches and it's it, it, the parallels between coaching and sales are wild. Like there, you know, I could, I could talk about it for an hour. You just hit a, a bunch of the things that you experience as a coach that directly align with a sales career. And I remember, you know, towards the end of 2021, me and you were chatting, I was kind of getting off the ground with shift group, getting ready to launch it. Um, and you kind of came to me and I always told you since, since we we're like, you know, since we we're like 27, 28, like, dude, you should be in sales, Donnell. Um, now, and it, but it was, it wasn't an easy decision. I know because you built a lot of equity. You, you, you were, you're very well respected in the industry. I think it's, it's, it's fortunate that you landed to stay in that industry and use that equity. Um, but like, let's talk a little bit about that transition. Now, my first question is, how do you end up in sales? Like, like, what was that process like? Um, I mean, if, 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 if you'll give me a little bit of liberty, I want to talk about, again, one of those moments that stands out to me as like, what, what kind of demystified sales? Like in, in, so in, in our, in our industry and in a lot of industries, sales has a, has a negative connotation with it. And, and I, I know you must have experienced that, but in coaching, it's almost like a sin because we're, we're supposed to be servants, right? We're supposed to be the servants of the program. We're support staff. We're, we're there to serve and we're there to serve the athletes and the coaches and all that. But when you start to understand like leadership and human motivation, you, you realize that influence is, is interwoven into every single piece of interpersonal communication in any job. And like a light bulb moment for me was probably, I want to say, and I'm going to probably get the date wrong. So if it, it was around 2014 or 2015, maybe 2016, there was a book that came out 
And it was called Brands Win Championships by a guy named Jeremy Darlow. He was, uh, he was a, a high up like marketing director for Adidas um, and had been over some of the big like alternative uniform uh, unveils and a lot of great creative strategies and, and initiatives with Adidas during his time. And he wrote this book. And in this book, there was like a, he had this chart. It, so picture, um, picture like an oval. And there was four stops on the oval, right? And it was recruiting. You got to recruit so you can get better players and enhance your chances to win. That was the next one, right? Winning. Why, why is it important to win and win championships? So you can get more donors and alumni support to get more revenue. Okay? And I'm, for, for everything, from facilities to, to salaries to yada, yada, yada. That needed to happen in the business of college athletics. Well, there was the, there was the last piece of it which really kind of clicked for me. And it was, it was perception, right? So if you could improve the perception of the program, you might improve your chances of getting recruits, which in turn improves your chances of winning, which improves your chances of, of alumni donations, et cetera. And this term perception stood out to me. Initially, I, I felt like it was a slimy word because you can manipulate people's perception. You, you know, you can, you can be a, a shady marketer and, and, you know, TikTok influencer who they're, they're out there to try to make a buck and they're manipulating your perceptions. But perception isn't about unethical things. It's, it's, it's about putting on display the good stuff that you do. And so that, that kind of, for me, it translated to if we have a perception of being an attractive place to work, it's easier for me to recruit interns. And if I can recruit interns, I've got better staff support. I can, I can, all of us can help do our job better and we can elevate the program. Conversely, I can help those interns land jobs because if we're perceived as a good place to work that does a great job as a strength conditioning department, people are going to trust that the interns that come out of us and the staff members that come out of us are going to be more reliable at their places of business. And so that, model stuck in my head for a while. And, you know, perception goes beyond that. It also goes beyond when I go to meet with somebody on my campus, what was the perception they had of me when I walked in the door? And how does it compare when I walked out the door? Because I'm sure when the strength coach comes in, a, a, an exercise science professor, they have a, they have a picture in their head of, of, of what that person's going to look like, sound like, and what they're going to care about. And it probably isn't a mirror reflection of themselves. So I, I, I learned the value of public relations, both on campus and off campus, and getting out there into the community and, and, and going across campus and walking into the military arm of campus and just striking up a conversation and saying, saying listen, we're at, we, have, we have good education and training in performance training. If you ever need help with the PT program here on campus, don't be afraid to reach out. And, and through those interactions, the, the, the opportunities and the support that grew, you, you cannot put a price tag on it. And, and so that was like the, my exposure to all this is, is tied up in the sales. Totally. And, and all that is tied up in the sales. So like that demystified sales for me. And then, like, you know, I can recall a book coming out uh, by Daniel Pink, who had studied motivation, uh, the science of motivation. That was he was getting all the all the rage in strength conditioning circles because it was how to unlock internal motivation. Well, his next book was called It's Human to Sell. And that book so was good. not as well received because it had the word sell on it. But I picked it up and I read it and I, I had my eyes opened uh, in a number of ways. So those were some of the kind of like dominoes that fell. Um, and, and, and made me stop pushing the idea away and like kind of embracing it. And then, man, like a really long story short, I've known the leadership at play for a very long time. They've been in my corner for a long time. We've done a couple projects together. I've known several of my peers and people I, I trust that have done way bigger projects than I was ever capable of doing and, and heard their experience. And the leadership team came to me you know, a year and a half ago or two years ago and started talking about, hey, man, like we've got an idea and we've got this role that we think would be beneficial to the company. But we want to talk about your interest in it. And that was how it all started, man. And, and 
needless to say, the, the idea, the setup, the structure, it made a lot of sense to me. And here we are. I love it. I love it. Um, and that book, by the way, To Sell is Human is so good. Uh, yeah. Anybody who's like on the bubble about sales, read that book. It'll, cha- it'll, it'll change your perception. And dude, you, you hit on something that I've had trouble communicating, but I think, I, I think what you just said puts it all together, which is sales at the end of the day is about educating the end user, understanding their motivation, and then influencing them uh, according to those motivations. And if, if their motivation doesn't align with, with your solution, moving on, right? Because the high pressure tactics, the lying, that's what people think of when they think of sales. That isn't sales anymore. It doesn't oh, work. Man. There's too much information out there, right? Not, so, not, dude, I love that. Not only does it not work, but it's damaging. Like, <laughs> yes. the, 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 the Citadel... And I've seen this happen, so I can speak to it. I've been there when we have had certain coaches who try to sell the place and not sell in the way we're talking about. They try to upsell the place and, 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 and keep some of the reality, uh, off, off of the, off of the screen for the, for the recruit. And there is no faster way to destroy a relationship. Then to be, then to, then to on the first transaction, you're dishonest because now that yep. person finds out the moment they walk on campus, Oh, we have to put a uniform on every day. My coach told me it was only half the time. Good luck with that. You have, you yeah. have just, that is irreparable. Yep. And so we at the Citadel, you had to find the kids that were the right fit that wanted to be there. That's the teams that were successful. And, and that you, you just made me realize that when you said like, it may not be for you, like our, our products are not for everybody. They are, um, they're, they're premium products. And, you know, it's like buying a car, man. I, I'd love to drive a, a Lamborghini, but I'm just not, I'm not at that point yet. So you, you know, you, you settle for the Volvo. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, not yet. Uh, <laughs> um, so, and by the way, like the, the idea of like hiding stuff behind a curtain now in college recruiting that talk about, talk about a, a, a huge kick in the butt there with the, in the yeah. transfer portal error, it's not going to work. Like you're going to, no you're going to be dealing with massive attrition. Um, tell, tell me a little bit, like what, what is your role, your role at play? Yeah. So I'm a business, I'm, my title is director of business development for college and pro sports. So, and, and I've listened to a couple of shows. Like, this is probably very different to your the, the BDR rules you guys talk about in the way that, that yeah. you know, the sales reporting structure is in the tech world. Yeah. Um, I'm basically meant to go find and drive business in that division. So what do the coaches, what do our potential customers are the coaches, the administrators, the people that are out there, who are going to consider buying our product? What do they need to know about us? What do they need to see from us? What kind of access do they need to have to us? How many touch points can we put and, and can we efficiently sustain out there? Um, I'm kind of at the intersection of almost every department. I've got input on the equipment that we're manufacturing. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a decision maker on it, but my input is, is, requested from time to time. It's valued there. Um, I'm involved with marketing on a regular basis in, in our creative team. A big part of my job is education. So like right now, this summer, I'm, uh, I'm organizing two educational clinics, different parts of the country. And the plan is to grow those, to you know, have four of them every year in a different region. That's, that's solely on my position. Um, there's a leadership component. I like this. Our, so our sales reps, we, we call them territory managers. And there's, you know, East Coast has four to five, Central, West, different territories in the country based on the amount of business that's out there. We'll have a number of territory managers. Each one of those territories will have a director. Um, and that's the reporting structure there. I'm in the mix somewhere loosely like above the territory managers, but in, in a bit of a peer relationship yeah. with the directors. And at the end of the day, man, I'm here to help everybody in those positions get, get their job done. Yeah. And, and so I, there is a sales component to me. I'm tied to the number that's, that's the athletics division, college and pro sports. And so if I'm lazy and I'm not there and I'm not accessible to our team and I'm not helping them get into places and make contacts using my network that, that maybe they're having a hard time with, 
they're not going to hit their number. I'm not going to hit my number. And then we all miss our, um, you know, our, our, um, our variable compensation that everybody's trying to hit. Yep. Uh, so that's kind of the structure there. I, I'm on a team of, of there's, there's four of us and each of the other business developers is in a different division. So like student recreation is a, or canvas mm -hmm. rec is a big one. And, and it's a big part of our company. Um, military government contracts is huge. Yep. And then like corporate, corporate fitness, corporate wellness is another big division, but each one of those divisions has a business developer on it. And we work as a team and, and interact weekly and try to get out there and support the, the territory managers from our, our post. That's awesome. What, what is, um, what has been the hardest part of the transition for you? Man. Um, you know, it, it hasn't been super hard and oddly, but it definitely hasn't been easy either. I think, um, and, and Anthony Bourdain quote stands out to me here. I was just watching his, uh, if you, if you haven't watched his, um, documentary called Roadrunner, it's, yeah. it's awesome, dude. So in it, he says he's out, he's waiting on a delivery outside of his uh, kitchen and he goes like the, the, the fish is going to be late or, or some delivery coming. It's going to be late. He gets off the phone and he goes, this is why all chefs are drunks because we can't understand why the outside world doesn't operate like our kitchen. And, and dude, that is, that is a strength coach to a T. Like, we all, all strength coaches have a little bit of obsessive compulsive disorder. You, you got to get your, you, you know, all the dumbbells got to be facing the right way. The place has got to be immaculately clean. It's got to be the right number of plates on each post because you have to be recruit ready at all times. You never know when a coach or the president of the school is going to walk in with some big alumni group. That room's got to be recruit ready at all times. And there's an element of control that that I had and, and every strength coach has because you're kind of like the king of your own kingdom. You're the king or queen of that weight room. And you can make any decision and, and, and keep that room the way you want it. Well, now I'm, I'm in a remote role with a company that's got over 80 people across it. <laughs> like we got people in the UK and Australia and you know, you're working remotely and business like, you don't have that control. That control is gone. So I've had to really adjust to, all right, man, I got to, I got to realize that the director over on the West coast doesn't operate like me. We've, we've got to find a way to come together, meet in the middle, see eye to eye and go out and find the best way to approach this customer over there who he knows better than me. And then the same thing is with every coach and every customer is different. You know, in the weight room, it, your, your team showed up and they had to abide by the rules or they were going to face consequences. Well, your customers, there ain't no rules for them. <laughs> your customers are going to want what they want. They're going to want it on the timeline that they want it. And you have got to be really adaptable and accommodating to them. And customer service has always been important to me. Um, that's why I say the adjustment hasn't been too tough. Because JR, if, if I tried to make this move six or seven years ago, it would have been very tough. I think I'm a more, more mature person even though I, I have to hide the laughter back as I, as I say that phrase coming, <laughs> coming out of my mouth. But I, I think my mindset, it, it has, it's mature. And I, you know, being around those, those suits, so to speak, you, you start to understand the business pros and you got to act more like a business pro. And so that's been an adjustment um, for sure. But man, if, you, if I talk about like, like how difficult it has been, that, I mean, if that's my hardest issue, I'm in a good, I'm in pretty good shape. Yeah. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I know for a fact because I, I looked at our program this morning. We have a huge chunk of coaches going through the the program with us right now. Um, nice. I'd love to hear like what's your guidance to them from like a mindset perspective and like just like a best practices perspective as they go through this transition from a career in coaching into a career in sales. Dude, number one, I'll give you a couple things here. Um, uh, two things that stand out right away. Number one is, man, you've been selling your whole career. <laughs> like if you're a coach thinking about this, you've been selling your whole career. You sell to recruits. You sold, you sold to, and I'm speaking as a strength coach, you had to sell to your head coach that your program was going to be right for the mm -hmm. off season. Yep. You had to sell to that administrator when you went and asked for $200,000 to redo the floor. You had to go sell that idea. Um, Man, my neighbor, like, 
he he dropped this one on on my plate. We were talking about um we were, he he's been in sales for a long time and he he threw this one out there and I was like, "Whoa, you are spot on. If you ever been in a huddle, you have done sales." Because if you were a person standing in front of that huddle, you were selling confidence to the, to the other the other people standing there looking at you. Yeah. Um so man, sports and coaching, like you've been doing sales whether you like it or not the whole time. And so you gotta, you gotta demystify it and, and take that just misplaced, baseless label that, that it has on it and, 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 and take a good look at it and see it for what it really, really is. Uh, because it, because as a person that's doing it and as, as a person that's been around some people that have been doing it at a high level, it is not some negative, toxic, you know, undesirable thing at all. It has not, by, not been my experience and not the experience of people that are closest to me. No. Um, I think the other thing I would say is just uh, as a coach, like you got to be wanting to make this move for something beyond money. Um, uh, well, let me back that up because I don't want to talk in any kind of absolute statements. If, if money's your thing, you probably have a much better chance of making money quickly doing sales, tech sales, or, or any type of sales related yeah. uh, job. And yeah. if that's your thing, then you're probably making a smart decision with, with making that move. If, if money's your thing, all the more power to you. I don't want to deter anybody by that. But if, if you're in that seesaw place where, 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 I, where I was for a while, which was, do I ever want to step away from this and what else is out there? Um, I think that if you can be honest about the fact that everything you did as a coach, believe it or not, really gave you a skill set and an on-the-job training, that makes you well prepared to go into these jobs. And it can totally. be any, any, that's what really excites me about what you're doing is because I think back to our kids and I think back to coaches that I worked alongside that, that, you know, maybe didn't, the, the career didn't work out or the kids didn't pay enough t attention at the job fairs. Um, it, it's such an exciting opportunistic world out there that um, I, I would suggest people like, you know, be at peace with the fact that you may not be interfacing with kids day to day anymore, but the things that you have been doing with those kids and within the walls of the athletic department alongside your coaches have really prepared you for a career like this. And, and to, if you're interested, man, take your best shot for yeah. sure. Yeah. And, and, and go out, have conversations like I know you did. I know you talked to a lot of people before you made the decision. That's an important piece. And I would add one nugget, like, the interactions you talked about with recruits, with administrators, with coaches, those are sales experiences. Even the little individual interactions you have with the student athlete on a day to day basis, right? If you're a defensive coordinator and you got a cornerback who's run it, who's who four years of high school ran a certain defense or played a certain route a certain way, and you guys don't do it that way. Getting them on board with your way is a sales interaction 100%. Like you've had more experience in sales than most salespeople have had because you have them so often in your career as a coach. So I, I love it, dude. So awesome. I'm curious to know, like you talked about the OCD nature of strength coaches, right? And I know in your career, you were super structured in the way you approached your day to day, your, your season, your year, right? Are you, are you approaching your sales career in a similar fashion? Like, are, do you have a, a, a longer plan? Um, or are you going day to day? Like, like, what do you, like, how are you approaching the sales role? Yeah. So, man, full transparency. And, and I reserve the right to be wrong. I'm just telling you my personal choice and what I did in my first six months. So working at a military college for 14 years straight, I woke up four to five days a week between 3.30 a.m. and 4 a.m. So... <laughs> When I joined this job, I, I made it a point to say, I'm going to go off the script and I'm going to get loose with my schedule just to see how it works, right? Here's, the, here's the, the realization that I had six months into it. And even now, a year, what are we, a year and five months into it. I don't know if I'm ever going to sleep past 5 a.m., JR. I don't think it's, I don't think it's possible. <laughs> like it should have, 
I, sh- I should be sleeping past that time by now. And I just don't. I think I'm like my, I think my DNA is like set for the rest of my life. I'm just going to wake up at 5 a.m. So now I just embrace it. Yep. Um, getting away from the structure I said, you know what? This is a, uh, it's a flexible job. It's work from home. It is going to be a lot of turbulence. I'm going to have to, if, if I get a call, big project, I got to go. I'm going to try to not keep a tight schedule. My opinion, not a good idea. Okay. Nope. Because your, your schedule gives you a, a stable footing that you fall back on when the surprises pop up. And now you might not be able to map out your whole day, which I certainly can't. But if there is something in the week that I can keep on every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all the way through at the same time, I do it. Um, and I have found that to work. So I've, I've, uh, dude, when you were mentioning how I, I did my homework coming into this job and I called people and I leaned on them, man, I, for the listeners out there, I would be embarrassed if you guys ever saw like, like my Evernote, um, JR, the way you mentioned that I studied for the, uh, the certification exams back, back in college to become a strength coach, I did that same thing when I was transitioning careers. Yeah. I've got an Evernote notebook that's like, it's notebook, notebook, notebook on like different sales articles, concepts. Like I got a YouTube video playlist that's just embarrassing. Like I, I would put two hours on my calendar a day and I would just search for sales training videos and like, populate the playlist. And I would study that stuff. Like I was preparing for an exam. I didn't want to come into this thing unstudied. And there's so much resource out there now that you can do that. Yeah. In case the shift group. Yep. Um, so, I, I mean, I put that homework in and I, I try to do that with my calendar. Like I, like our company is a, is a Google company and like my Google calendar is all color coded and I batch throughout the day. Um, everything from, workouts to like breakfast, <laughs> you know, you can only get breakfast in between eight and nine. Like that goes on my calendar. That that's just the way that I operate. Yep. So yeah. Transparency wise, I tried to not do that for a period of time. I found out quickly that that was not the right battle rhythm for me. And I am back on that calendar. I lean on that calendar. And, um, and it's interesting to see as you, you know, you look to the left and the right, your coworkers and whatnot, not everybody operates like that. Not everybody needs to. Maybe maybe they're just more organized mentally than me. But man, I can tell you, if I'm going on a trip across the country, I want to see that itinerary and see what, where our appointments are, so I can plan, you know, around it. Um, yeah. So that's the way my week and the way my my schedule looks like for sure. Yeah, and 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 like to be honest, I, I I'm so glad you went there because we we teach a course called you know operational excellence, and like I'm I'm a big believer, and maybe it's because I'm the same way as you, but I, but I we've seen it now where the kids that go and take the structure they had as college football players or you know uh, Olympic athletes or whatever they're doing, or military right because we do a lot of military veterans now applying that structure to your 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 day your week your month your quarter is going to save you because this is sales, right? It's a roller coaster. So you've got to have that steady, I call it an operating rhythm. Like this is my operating rhythm. Things are going to happen. I'm going to have to be adaptable, but you've got to have that structure to have consistent success, right? Even a broken clock is right twice a day. If, if you don't, like you're going to have a good quarter, you're going to have a good year. Everybody, everybody does. But if you don't have a, a way to like show your work, like this is how I had a good quarter. This is how I had a good year. It's not going to be repeatable for you. So I'm glad, I'm glad you learned your lesson that way. And a lot oh, yeah. of people have to, have to, have to have that kind of come to Jesus moment too. Um, yeah. Curious to know, like what, what, do, what are some of your goals you're, you're hoping to accomplish at, at play? Oh man. Um, you know, I, I mean, obviously like the, the metrics, like, Every, every team starts the year wanting to win the championship. Like, like the, the number, you know, our, our college and pro sports, that number. I mean, I keep that thing situated. I look at it every now and then. Um, I'll tell you, I'm even, even within the CRM, like I'm still learning how to run yeah. the right reports that are going to give me the, the instantaneous snapshot of like, where are we at right now in the week? And, I, and I've got a great supervisor who is just a wealth of knowledge. She's been in the business for a, a long, long time. And like, she's a great resource to help get that, that ability up. That's something I'm learning, man. That, so when you ask me about challenges, like that's one of them is just to, 
like I'm, I'm familiar with software, but that CRM and all the, all the freaking acronyms and knowing like what these figures actually mean and how to run reports that are going to give you uh, actionable information um, uh, quickly. That, yeah. that stuff has been a process for the first, uh, the first 12 months or so. But, um, you know, so I want to hit the goals that are, that are on top of it. Those are important, man. Like, like I don't stop thinking about them um, at, at any point. But then I also want to be a good teammate. Like, I want to be the person that, that when they hired me, um, I, I want to be, I want, when people ask, like, how's he been to work with? I, I want to have a solid rep- reputation. I want to be reliable. I want people to trust that when I get put into the equation, I'm going to be additive. And, and, and not be subtracting, uh, from the, from the process. And, um, you know, I, I want to be able to like put myself in a position that I was in at the Citadel where keep getting trust, keep earning trust, become more after I become effective with my job, um, improve efficiency so I can do the work in less time. And, and then I can find out, um, I used to say that to my staff when I would hire people. I'm like, we're going to get you effective. Then we're going to get you efficient. And then I'm going to find a way to expand what you're doing here. And that's what I did for myself the entire time. That's what I want to do here. I want to, I want to get really good at my job as it stands right now, make my time more efficient so I can free up to, to go out there and find some other things and ways to help and then expand my responsibilities and hopefully climb up. You know, I want to ladder up. Um, for Dude, sure. This wasn't I'm, something. Go ahead. I'm writing that down. That's unbelievable. Effective, yeah. efficient, and expansion. That's yeah. freaking awesome. Oh, I love that. Um, yeah, because the interns would come in and they'd say, well, you know, what, what, what's, because it's tough for them, JR. They, they have to, they got to get a job. They got to do, the job is demanding enough. But almost from the moment you take that internship or that graduate assistantship, you're looking for the next job. Yeah. And so what I would tell them is like, listen, don't put the cart before the horse. Just get really, let's get you effective. Then we're going to make you efficient. And if you don't, if you don't ever become effective, you can't waste your time trying to be more efficient because now nope. you're not doing your job. And, yeah. and the evaluation that I'm going to give you when somebody calls me is not going to be great. So effectiveness is number one. Then we can get more efficient to free up your time. And then we're going to expand your role. It's the same thing that I, that's the same way that I thought about myself. hundred percent. I love it. I love it. So, so you were, you were highly researched, you know, spent a lot of time on YouTube and I know you spent a lot of time in like live conversation too. When you, now that you're in it, you know, a year and a half, a little more than a year and a half, what, what have you learned so far about sales that has surprised you the most? Oh, man. Um, you know, when I, when I started, I thought, I guess this is going to be about like the pipeline, like the sales pipeline. I, I thought, hey, this is my buddy. He just called me up. He had me up for a meeting. We're going to go talk. They've got a project looming in the six to 12 month time frame. I go there. We have a phenomenal conversation. It's doors wide open, super hospitable, whatever you want, man. You know, get out there with the kids, all this stuff. I'm, you know, I'm there for an hour. Hey, let me know if you ever got anything down the road, man. I'd love to help you out and like walk out of there. And I'm walking out of there, and in my mind, I'm like, man, that was a freaking, not a home run. That was a grand slam. Like, that's, that's going to be business. <laughs> In the, in three months, that dude's calling me and we're doing a project. Three months rolled around, never got the call. Started to wonder. And I'm like, you know, six months down the road, might see a, a social media post. Somebody else's floor is going in that room. What, what happened? You know, never got the call. Uh, long story short, you learn that what I've learned is that that pipeline is an ongoing process and. I almost think about it now as like the garden analogy. Like when you got a garden, it is an active process to cultivate that garden. I thought you have the meeting, you set the pipeline, and they're going to call you when they're ready. <laughs> that is not the case. <laughs> you have a garden, you got to make sure that garden's getting sunlight. You got to water that garden. You got to keep the rodents out of that garden, <laughs> out of that garden. And um, I have learned that the, uh, that there's a real sense of urgency and it is coming from the most positive place. Yes. I used to think that me calling somebody to follow up would, 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 would piss them off. It would, it would, it would, it would wear them out. So I didn't want to do it. 
But then I realized, man, like there's a way to handle urgency with tact and you can do it professionally. If I'm calling a person every frigging day and just being a nuisance, well, then I'm not being very professional. I'm not doing it with tact. But if I know that if I don't follow up on some sort of a schedule with these and the intervals can be different, like our, our job projects can be three months. They could be three years. I've got to know that I've got to do my research. I've got to have a good finger on the pulse of that project in that school or that organization. Then I got to have the right time intervals to follow up because it's not about like, you're not, I'm not trying to harass the person into the sale. I can't, there's no amount of times I can call an AD and it's just going to speed their timeline up. Like that, that doesn't work like that. Yeah. But what can happen is, is ADs and strength coaches are super busy and they, they might inadvertently just lose track of a timeline that it happens a lot with high schools, school board. If you let that thing linger for months and months and months, and you're not actively trying to help it across the finish line, the school board might just, it might be sitting there so long. Somebody's looking at the numbers and they say, Oh, this money hasn't been used in 10 months. Let's put it somewhere else. And that's not the fault of the coach. That's not the fault of that. That's, that's kind of on me for not ushering them along and partnering with them to, to see that thing hit the end zone. And that's been yeah. probably the biggest lesson that I've learned is that that urgency is healthy and it's there for a reason. And I got to stop looking at it through that negative lens. Totally. Totally. I, I call it professional persistence. That's what it's about. Right. And, and, and the touch points aren't just like, Hey, just checking in. It's like, it could be educational. It's like, Hey, I just read this article, thought you'd be interested in it based off our conversation back in March. Just wanted to share it. Hope all is well. Looking forward to catching up soon. Right. Like it's, it's about being creative and, and having those touch points. Um, and I, and, and the good, the good meeting, happy ears that you get early in your sales career. I can relate to that so much. I'll never forget. Like I had an unbelievable meeting at, it was at CBS. I was like 25. It would have been, it would have been a life changing deal for me. And I left and I told, I told my boss, I'm like, man, I had a great meeting. Um, uh, that's, you know, and I moved the deal in, in our CRM up to like strong upside. And he, and he, he said to me something that I'll never forget. He goes, JR, I don't pay you for fucking good meetings. <laughs> and he's like, you need to stay on, stay on that opportunity. You need to continue to educate. Right. And, and we ended up like, I, I lost that deal and, and it was a, such a key wake up moment for me, dude. So I love that. That's a great story. Um, I just wrote that one down. <laughs> well, listen, uh, we got, we do these final two questions. I know you're ready for them. Um, first question, right? If we ask you to highlight one skill that you think makes you an elite salesperson, what is, what is the skill that you would highlight? Well, I'm far from an elite salesperson yet, but I'm on my way. Um, what, what do I, what do I think would, would make me that <clears throat> um, two things come to mind. I, I'm a genuinely curious person. Um, I that. am intrigued by finding out the why behind systems, decisions, processes, histories, all of the above. So when I go and I interface with a customer, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, I am genuinely invested into learning about their pain points, what they've been dealing with. Because the more that I learn their context and background, the more that I can take my experience and what I've found already in less than a year and a half is there are a few conversations that I'm in that I can't point back to something I've already lived. I've walked that walk. I've been through it. I'm not saying that I've came out on top on every one of those experiences. Sometimes the the, the misses and the losses are better feedback to provide them. But um, I am a genuine, like, curious person when it comes to meeting new people, dealing with customers, um, and also, like, our products and the, and, the, and the way that they go in the room, all that stuff, man. I'm, I'm genuinely invested in understanding the why behind it. And I think the other thing um, is... You know, wherever this came from is, is I can, I think I'm a very adaptable person. I think I've had yeah. a, a career and an upbringing that has exposed me to many different backgrounds, experiences, walks of life. 
And uh, when I when I think about my time at the Citadel, you know, we had this thing somewhere on the wall. It said, be the thermostat. And most of the time in a weight room, that meant you needed to crank the kids up. You needed to crank the room up, crank the heat up. Um, and nine times out of 10 as a strength coach, that's what it means. Yeah. But in this world, it doesn't mean that all the time. It, it means you need to take it down a notch and you need to meet your customers, your coworkers, where they're at. And make sure you're having a desirable and a comfortable conversation or interaction with them. So sometimes you got to upregulate. Sometimes you got to downregulate. I think I can do that at a pretty high level. Communication, um, communication is a dance. You know, it's it's you're dancing with that other person, and you've got to read, react. You got to read, recognize, and react on a on a whim. And I think like. In particular, man, my time at the Citadel and going through that career trajectory, you learn how to code switch in, in, in different interactions, man. Like talking to the commandant who was a colonel, a, a Navy SEAL commander, you know, we got a three-star general on campus, was very different than talking to the offensive coordinator or the captain of the volleyball team. Yep. And you found yourself code switching four or five times a day in, in those scenarios. I think that's a skill that definitely is going to serve me in this, in this game. A hundred percent. And by the way, you just named the episode, dude, be the thermostat. I freaking, I'm putting that on a t-shirt kid. I love awesome. that. I love, oh, I love that. Too. That's great. Oh, uh, all right. So last question, man. Um, so we, we always like, you know, my background with my old man, right? Like we, we were taught professionalism from an early age. And, and I think the reason I've had success as a salesperson is, is because I've approached it as a profession, like a professional athlete. And I think the highest praise you can give a, a salesperson is calling them a pro. And I'm sure you've come across people that you would consider pros in your career already. Um, so what does being a pro in sales, what does that mean to you? Man, you know, be, uh, obviously the, like the easy ones for me are, are reliability, consistency, showing up every day. When you say pro, I think like the pros that I'm around, you can go and visit an NFL weight room. Those dudes are in there. They take a beating at the games. Um, but you got to show up even though you don't feel too good. But when I think about being a pro and especially what I've experienced in sales so far is like, and this has a lot less to do with talent or, 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 or skill, I guess it probably has more to do with like awareness and, and, and determination. It's the, the people that I've come to meet and I respect the most, they care about what happens after the sale. They, they care about the deal, obviously. And like, let's, let's get this thing closed. But they're also thinking about and talking about, and in my experience, people that I'm drawn to, they're talking about how that sale and how that deal is going to impact all parties concerned after the fact. And what our company, one of the things I love is like, we call it cradle to the grave. We don't just sell a project or a room and then we're out the door onto the next one. Like you got an issue down the road. It's, it's me that shows up to deal with it. And I love that piece of it because I've been on the other side of it. Um, and it's not a great feeling when you got to get some support, some assistance back in and, you know, it's hard to get somebody on the phone and, and it's hard to get some help. So I think, I think pros care about what happens after the sale. <clears throat> and I can tell you for me personally, man, how I want to go about this thing is I want to be, I know you can win and lose. Like you're going to win sales. I'm not going to win them all. You can't win them all. So you're going to win some sales. You're going to lose some sales, some sales, some, some deals. But I think the ultimate professionals that I've gotten to be around so far, they're going to win and they're going to lose. But even on the sales that they lost, they're going to walk away with a strength in relationship. Yep. And that's been like in the front of my mind since, since the moment I shifted over here was, I'm going to go do this job and I may not be great at it. I'm going to give it my all. But even on the ones that I lose, I'm going to walk away with a stronger relationship because that might turn into the next sale. Yeah. So that's what I think, you know, professionalism is for me in this world that might be my favorite answer you know my hashtag all gas no breaks when when i say there's a couple meanings to it but but the gas means give a shit right and and that's yeah. what you're talking about like you if you go in 
to a company or an organization and you give a shit about the outcomes that your solution can drive, the problems that you can solve for them and what that means for their business, which in the case of colleges and, and, and professional teams is better performance on the field, better ticket sales, better revenue, like that, that alone, you'll figure out the right things to do in the process, right? Because you really do care. So that might be my favorite answer ever, dude. This was <laughs> unreal. I'm so happy that you got on this, on this uh, episode, dude. I thank you so much for your time, man. I'm pumped for this thing to come out. Pleasure's all mine. And dude, I'm a huge fan of what you guys are doing. I wish you guys all the best. And I, I'm, I'm really excited to share this with all my former athletes and my, and my peers out there. I can't, I can't thank you guys enough for having me. I love it. Be the thermostat, everybody. Let's go. This wraps up this episode of Merchants of Change. If you enjoyed this episode, the most meaningful way to say thanks is to submit a review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're interested in working with us, please come find us at www.shiftgroup.io.